Hey there, dear story manifesta! I'm so glad you're here. On this channel, we talk about writing mindset, writing pep talks, and all things storytelling. I'm Leia Falls, writer, actor, and empowerment coach, and today is the first video in a new exciting series called Toxic Tropes. So we will be talking about tropes that seem very common and normal, but actually have quite a toxic background and history and implications to them. Today we'll be talking about romanticized jealousy and idealized jealousy in fiction. Let's jump in. We're going to go over this in four different points. Four. Yes. What is the trope? Where did it come from? What's wrong with it? What's toxic about it? And what can we write instead? So let's start with number one. What is the trope? We all know it, romanticized jealousy. We've seen it in the book, movie, show, written it ourselves. I'm guilty of that as well. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples just so that we are really clear what we're talking about here. First example, the best friend of your protagonist has a new date and your protagonist gets really upset over that. And uh, through that upsetness slowly realizes, oh no, I'm in love with my best friend. So they realize that love through jealousy. Another example, your protagonist has a new partner and love and absolutely adore them. And suddenly everyone else that could be attracted to their partner becomes the enemy. And they're becoming very paranoid and looking around and anyone talking to them could potentially steal them away. And we see that especially in movies and books that the character goes uh, to more and more escapades to stop it and keep their partner as theirs. Um, and it's, it's often played for laughs, sometimes it's also played for a certain level of relatability, but it's always about this, wow, this is our new fresh love and I love this person so much, I need to keep them from anyone else who could love them. And while we often laugh at the ways this is played out, it does also teach us, yes, this is true love. Another example would be an older married couple that's been together for quite some time and might be having some relationship issues and their love gets reignited when someone else hits on one of the one of the two. Um, so it's I, I see it often with like a man and a woman, uh, an older man and a woman and um, the woman suddenly gets attention from like another older gentleman or maybe a younger one and suddenly the man realizes what he really has and starts fighting for it and their whole passion reignites. In all three of these instances, jealousy is framed very romantically and while yes there's some laughs around it, some uh, like temporary not quite wise decisions, it is all shown as big acts and signs of love. Number two, where did it come from? Jealousy is a completely normal, natural human emotion. Uh, it is usually associated to the fear of losing something, the belief in one's own inadequacy in some way or another, and a general scarcity mindset around love and affection and time of another person. And I want to make it very clear here that I'm neither trying to disprove that jealousy exists, disprove monogamous relationships and their functionality. That is not the point of this video. The point is talking about romanticized jealousy, so jealousy as an ideal and as a um, good part of a relationship. So jealousy in itself is a completely normal human emotion. While we all experience it, the light-hearted or dramatic but relatable version of jealousy that we do see in fiction and media is culturally developed. The great anthropologist Margaret Mead studied the social aspects of jealousy throughout the 20th century. She discovered that while jealousy exists everywhere, its connection to romantic relationship and necessity in romantic relationship is part of our culture, not nature in general. After studying Samoan cultures for years, she came to this discovery. Romantic love, as it occurs in our civilization, inextricably bound up with the ideas of monogamy, exclusivity, jealousy and undeviating fidelity does not occur in Samoa. So why are these ideas so intrinsic in our Western culture, but not in other cultures? Why did it develop everywhere if it's just part of our human experience? According to the Biology of Moral Systems by R.D. Alexander, our romantic ideal doesn't stem from shared values or religiously influenced ideas. 
although they did play a part in it. It stems from monogamy laws that were established by ancient Greco-Roman and European leaders to grow armies quicker. Now, to understand this a little bit better, we have to see that their society's survival depended on reliable and quick population growth. And monogamous families were just much more strategic for that, because if you have two people that can um, have a good chunk of children that exponentially gets, you know, creates a bigger society is very reliable because it can be repeated. Whereas in polyamorous relationships and societies, you can't depend on it as much. And there's potentially, you know, constructs where five people are raising one child, so you wouldn't have as much of breeding done as you would in a monogamous system. So monogamous groups were just simply more suited for quick population growth, which then served a quicker military growth, which then meant that the um, smaller societies had a higher chance of surviving. So what does it all have to do with jealousy though? Romantic jealousy comes from the idea that the worth of any kind of relationship completely stems from its exclusivity, that that is the core value of a good relationship. Defending that exclusivity benefited political leaders in the expansion of society and in their military pursuits. Therefore, it was culturally incredibly encouraged and it became the norm because it was connected to survival, to being a good citizen, to being a good and worthy part of the community. By the time that written storytelling became widely available, those ideas had already been ingrained in people's minds for generations. They were just standards again, we, we didn't question them anymore. So jealousy in romantic relationships were looked at as a big sign of love instead of as a sign of insecurity, which we might want to look at from a psychological point of view nowadays. It's also important to note at this point how gender roles influence how we perceive jealousy in a cultural context. Through conditioning, masculine identified people are more likely to perceive non-exclusivity, whether it be ethical or not, so whether it be uh, consensual that in a relationship there can be other partners or just straight out cheating, that doesn't matter. But masculine identifying people uh, are more likely to consider non-exclusivity as an attack on their pride that something from them was taken. So it's much more of like a prideful attack. Whereas feminine identifying people, and I'm saying it like this because I do want to include non-binary people in this, um, and feminine identifying people are more likely to perceive jealousy and like cheating and exclusivity as a sign that they're doing something wrong, as a sign of their own inadequacy, because somehow they couldn't hold their partner. Like the traditional cis heteronormative um, view on this is they couldn't hold their man, but it's the, the whole idea that they did something wrong, they weren't enough, and that's why the cheating is happening. And there's sexism rooted in that as well, because in our patriarchic society, Either way, no matter what the constellation is, cheating is considered to be the woman's fault. Even if, the, let's say, we're talking about a straight couple, straight cis couple, and the man cheats, we are automatically more likely to demonize the woman he cheats with than the man himself. Now, I'm against demonization in general here, but um, it's very interesting where we place the blame in that scenario. And interesting, in a way, interesting how sexism is being conditioned into our culture. So I scratched on this a little bit already, but number three, what's wrong with it? Jealousy coming up in relationships is completely normal and worth exploring, but when we romanticize and idealize it, we're romanticizing and idealizing insecurity, codependency, and possessiveness. And those three can be quite dangerous to romanticize. So let's talk about insecurity. When your character bases their whole value on getting the boy-girl person, then they're placing their value, their happiness, their whole being on another person instead of in themselves. So there's an ingrained insecurity in that belief already because they're not enough by themselves. They're just 
they're not enough. They need to get that person. When someone shows interest in their partner, they fail to see their own worth for the person and the worth of that unique relationship. And furthermore, that character believes that their lovability depends on whether or not they fulfill another person's every need. And that is not healthy. And that's where insecurity comes in. Because um, a character and a person might get jealous when they believe another person can give their partner something that they can't give. And that's not necessarily a problem, but it is a problem if you have to believe that you have to be everything for that person. And while all of this makes for really interesting conflict in books and in stories, it should be a conflict and not the ideal. Uh, because what's the problem if we make that our ideal? It's toxic because it strengthens our collective narrative that we need other people to complete us, that we aren't whole beings by ourselves, that then seek connections and create community, but instead we are inherently broken and we're trying to find someone else to fix us, to fill us. So there's this we're not at codependency yet, but, but that is the underlying belief that the narrative is strengthening. It is reinforcing the thought that if we do not comply with societal expectations and don't really fit in or don't succeed at them, we are inherently at fault and we should feel bad about ourselves in some way. So it's if we don't distinguish that jealousy specifically as insecurity, we fail to give our character the strength that they really have and we fail to honor their individual worth because otherwise their success depends on another person's feelings and actions and if they fail to control those feelings and actions through jealousy then they fail as a person. Idealized romantic jealousy also encourages us to compare ourselves to other people. We have to judge our own bodies, minds, humor and it needs to be better than not just someone else's but everyone else that could potentially be in the partner's vicinity because otherwise we are not enough. So it is coming with a lot of judgment on ourselves, on our partners too. Because if we think that the partner can be stolen away by someone else, we do not trust that they can see the worth in us either. And that is super interesting character conflict, but it's a conflict. It is not the ideal. This is not how we should be approaching relationships and should be approaching ourselves in connection. We shouldn't uphold the narrative that we need to be better than someone else in order to remain lovable. That lovability is inherently a contest because that is a toxic ideal. Now let's talk about possessiveness. And before we talk about this, I wanna give a quick trigger warning because I will be talking about domestic abuse here and cheating um, and general toxic family dynamics. Um, please go into the description if you want to skip that. I will be linking the exact times in which I talk about it there. Okay, cool, let's go on. Romanticized jealousy also comes with seemingly innocent phrases like, you're mine, you belong to me. And while I personally love the idea of we are a team against the world as you and me and we can do it um, and that whole narrative, if we look at what those phrases are actually saying and language is so important because even if we're saying things and just they're throwaways, I mean that's the whole foundation of mindset, even if they're just throwaways and they're just like, oh, I'm such an idiot, you're telling yourself that. I am an idiot. And if you're saying you are mine, there's an inherent possessiveness in the relationship. If your character wishes someone else was theirs, or they're fighting to make them theirs, that they become their partner, theirs, it's, it's all involving around the possession of that person and the control of that person instead of the, you know, proximity, closeness, connection, because saying I want you to belong to me is very different from I want to nurture a deep connection with you. It also implies that the only way to know that a love is real and true is to make rules for that partner, which is inherently somewhat controlling. It's not the, the idea of romanticized jealousy is that the foundation of our love is that I have some control over you, not that I am helping you and supporting you and adding value to your life so that you become more and more true to yourself. No, it's not about that. And I'm receiving the same to myself and I'm receiving the same from you. It's not about that. It's about making rules for them. And those rules have to be followed. And that is the whole basis of trust here. 
we see this conflation between love and control in a lot of other relationships as well. We see this whole idea of forging a person into exactly the perfect person and helping like make them who you want them to be in family dynamics, in friendships. And it is a super interesting and sad reality of life that there's a lot of, you know, our insecurities and our need to control each other is coming out in this world in so many different levels. And it's super interesting to explore in storytelling. It's super important to explore in storytelling, but it needs to be explored from a critical lens. We cannot say that people belonging to us and us wielding that level of control over them is inherently romantic or shows how much we care about them. Because this celebrated possessiveness unfortunately has many real life consequences. There are many articles on the subject, including one study I found in the East Asian Archive of Psychiatry that discusses how jealousy, how sexual jealousy specifically and sexual possessiveness is the number one reason for domestic abuse, domestic violence and partner murder because it's this whole concept of this person belongs to me and they are breaking the rules. And because of that, I am allowed to punish them for it. And fiction encourages this kind of thinking. There's so many movies where it's completely justified to violate the partner's boundaries. And those boundary violations often seem justified in media, even if there's just a paranoia of, of potential cheating, potential infidelity, or just the slightest suspicion. And it is played up for laughs so often, the whole detective plot and the whole, oh yeah, spying on my husband, spying on my wife thing. And it's, it all comes from the place of possessiveness and the place of control. And once again, all this makes for excellent conflict. We want to see where love switches into control and why possessiveness is destroying the trust within two people. That's super interesting to explore, but it needs to be the conflict and it's not romantic. And very often it is shown as a grand romantic gesture, maybe a little over the top, maybe a little extreme, but still a sign of true love. Now there's a lot of examples for it. The most obvious one being Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> But I want to show how common it is. So I want to talk about Harry Potter. Will Crick, I um, am coming from a huge, huge Harry Potter fandom background. I, I have a tattoo of it. I'm a diehard fan. The recent developments with JK Rowling, I have distanced myself from that world. It's a whole nother subject. I just want to say that I am approaching a series with a lot of love, but also with a critical eye now. And that's where I'm coming from when I'm looking at possessiveness and jealousy and romanticized jealousy in Harry Potter. Actually, all of the main couples have a big element of that, of that being what brings them together. I want to specifically look at Harry and Ginny here. Harry felt so sure of Ginny's affection for such a long time that he realizes his love for her when she's suddenly no longer his, when it's no more an assured thing. But we shouldn't look at this as an automatic sign of love. Instead, we should look at this as an insecure person's reliance on another person's validation and their complete inability to make their personal needs clear. He never met her needs beforehand. He never made his needs of the relationship clear or examined. And now he is a teenage boy, but still we're seeing it's shown in a very romantic light that now that she's with Dean, now he's realizing that he's in love with her. But no, what he's realizing is that that he relied on that affection to validate himself. And he was also relying on Ginny's admiration without having to do anything. And once he feels the lack of that, that's when he fights to get it back. He fights to get that admiration and that affection back, not to provide anything to her life initially. And of course, there's a romantic connection that builds alongside of all of this, and there can be romantic love involved of that. But if jealousy is what brings two people together, it is about possession and not about love initially. And that is for us so important to see, because they were great friends. They, he could have already nurtured a much closer relationship with her. It's but it's the exclusivity and it's the he needs to be the one kissing her and having specific physical romantic interactions and sexual interactions, because that's implied with it, with her and exclusively. And that is the only thing he wants instead of focusing of, hey, 
I I'm really really interested in this person. I want to nurture a complete wholesome more relationship with them and a stronger connection with them and that might sound idealistic but it's sounding idealistic right now because we're not presented that narrative in media at all. We're not presenting the option that platonic love is very valuable and important to pursue and that if you really want more time with a person you gotta see what you actually want from them and you gotta understand your needs with them and you, you gotta see what you can actually give them and out of that more relationship facets can grow and romantic relationships can grow but if we're just making it about possession and jealousy and and just having exclusivity over someone we are by skipping so many important facets of what makes us work together what makes people work together and this is also where the whole friend zoning idea comes from and that's very prevalent in our everyday life but it's also very prevalent in media and it's always like a, oh you've been friend zoned without valuing the connection that's actually there friend zone means that you're already close friends and yes you like another aspect of that but if we say that aspect is all that matters we're discarding the person as a whole we're discarding the connection that is already there and we are reducing our ability to connect to one another and to build good relationships on soul romantic interactions and sexual interactions. That's also completely leaving out aromantic and asexual people um, out of the picture of having being able to form any kind of relationships, which is cruel and not how we, you know, wants to represent society and human nature in our stories. And I'm not saying here that heartbreak isn't real and doesn't exist and that you can't be distraught and sad over not being able to pursue this specific relationship that you have in mind with a person, but it becomes problematic and potentially toxic if that is stretched out over long periods of time in stories where it's just like, no, nope, I'm going to keep holding on, I'm going to keep holding on. Because that character is then completely ignoring all the other possibilities and opportunities of relationship blossoming with that person. And if that person is just keeping them on the hook, and if that's kind of the story, then there's complete, like there's, there's a distrust and disconnect from the beginning. So pursuing and getting that one romantic relationship is not going to fix the initial misalignment and the disrespect that's brought into the relationship from both sides. So yes, let's explore heartbreak, please, but let's explore it from a lens of something that you can get over with and something that is not, um, that doesn't doom you if you are not succeeding in the societal expectations of getting that one person exclusivity. Going back to the insecurity, that is very much putting your value on someone else. And now we're going to codependency number three of that little list. Because similar to the insecurity aspect, codependency means that the character is not alone on their own. And their whole identity is defined by being part of a couple. And that's something we see in society all the time. It's like the other half. So you are already walking around half. You're not a whole person. You need someone else. And while we are biologically designed to live in a community and have connections, and we do need that to survive, connect to things, connect to people, connect to living, breathing beings, the idea that you are not complete, that you are broken unless you find the one other fitting person that completes you, is toxic. And it also leads back to the patriarchal idea of the family unit and needing to conform to it to be the ideal uh, vessel in society, to be the kind of person that has value to society. You need to fit into the family unit. In 1947, the term nuclear family was originally coined and it shifted the focus to mother, father, child relationships and that being the family unit instead of an extended family network, which is how we have been living for a really long time. It also means that suddenly you are only depending on one other adult in your family to raise your child, to fulfill your needs, to fulfill the household's needs. Instead of having a wider spread of community where you can go to and be charged with and fulfill your needs with. And this fosters fear and insecurity and unhealthy attachment. 
because you're completely reliant on this unit staying intact instead of knowing that you have a network to fall back on. It's the difference between taking a hike to a beautiful, clear spring water, little river every morning and just enjoying the freshness of the water and it waking you up and it being a complete, vital, beautiful part of your day that you treasure and love. And that water being the only water you have to survive. That's what the difference is here. If you lose the first one, it's a really sad closure of a very important chapter in your life and it is loss and grief of something that you genuinely love. But if you lose the second one, you die. But the loss of love doesn't have to be a death sentence for the love to be true. That is something that we see in stories so often and it completely eradicates our worth as individuals and it also paints a very sad narrative. It paints this whole idea that, you know, we, we can be married for 60 years and then if the partner dies, we are basically dead. And I thought that was romantic for a really long time. But it's not because we all matter as individuals too. And our happiness and what we can bring to the world doesn't stop when the person that we're spending our, most of our attention to outside of ourselves is no longer there. We still have all of that in us and the love itself that you share with another person that two characters share also continues to live on if just one person continues to treasure it. So I really think it is time to bury this whole idea that we need the other person to survive because if you rely on something to survive that doesn't mean you love or treasure it. I mean, how many people hate drinking water and need to be reminded of it? And that's kind of the whole idea too. If you're in a relationship just because you need it to survive, then you might need to make yourself reminders of like, okay, I need to, you know, we need to have regular date nights. We need to talk more often and it, it needs to work. It needs to work. Instead of coming at it from such a joyful and celebratory view because love can blossom there in a much more healthy way. Love should be the motivator behind the character making a dear one happy, not the fear that if they lose that person, they lose the entire support system. Because I don't think that is the purest and sweetest kind of love. Mental Health America defines codependency as a learned behavior that is passed on to generations. It includes the need to do anything to avoid abandonment, while also having an innate distrust in yourself and the partner. And storytelling has reinforced this through generations as well with the jealousy narrative. It requires a lack of trust in the partner and unhealthy attachment. It requires your character to, to completely rely on having that person while also not trusting that that person actually wants to be with them, that they know how the person is going to act and that they are enough by themselves. In classic infidelity stories are even worse than that because they make the reader or viewer condemn the act of cheating, the rule breaking, as the sole issue here. When cheating is actually about someone who's incapable of expressing their needs and trusting their partner while also being fearfully dependent on a relationship. The whole betrayal here shouldn't be how could you sleep with her, it should be how could you pretend this relationship works for you when it doesn't. That's the real betrayal. The illusion that something was working when it was not. The illusion that the love was truthful and easy and beautiful when it was not. When it was forced, when it wasn't working. That's the real problem here. But the thing is, the cheating narratives and jealousy narratives and all the stories we tell ourselves around jealousy reinforce the idea that we can't discuss things with our partner. So it, re it completely enforces this lack of trust and this unhealthy detachment, so it's more likely that if a relationship isn't working or if something, if some needs aren't met, that isn't discussed out of fear of it being blown into the kind of stories that we see everywhere. Romanticized jealousy reinforces codependency while robbing us of any alternatives. Number four, what to write instead. We need to examine jealousy for what it really is, a culturally encouraged insecurity that gets conflated with love. 
Jealousy is always a character's personal struggle, a very interesting one, but a personal struggle. It is never about another character. It is never about the character's partner. It might be partially about their relationship, but the root of it is always within the character. If the love interest is making the character jealous, the character is lacking trust in themselves, in their love interests and in the relationship. Storytelling should also be critical of the narrative that only romantic and sexual relationships are of value, that platonic relationships aren't, can never be on the same value, that just romantic relationships can never be on the same value, that just sexual and platonic relationships can never be on the same value. All of that is a narrative that we are reinforcing. But it is coming from the idea that one person needs to fulfill all of it instead of saying that you can have the closest, most beautiful platonic relationship and it's just not needing the other sides of it because that's not how those two people and those two characters connect. Also in storytelling, we should move past that idea that competing with other people creates genuine affection. It is a competition, it creates lack. It does not create genuine affection. So let's talk about the love triangle here for a second. Because I'm not saying you can't write love triangles at all. But a love triangle is one of four options. Number one, the character isn't that fond of either one of them. And that's something cool to explore. That they, the character has two different options. But neither actually feel fitting. But they feel somewhat obligated to get a partner. And interesting turmoil. Number two, the character confuses romantic, sexual, and platonic love. And that is completely believable in our society where we devalue platonic love and devalue romantic love without sexual encounters. So maybe if there's two options, one of them is just a deep platonic love that is mistreated as potentially romantic or potentially sexual too, because there's all this pressure of it to be that way. Number three, the character struggles or doesn't feel safe to communicate their actual feelings. That's very interesting as well. Maybe they do know which one they would prefer, but there's so many factors and expectations and pressures and some genuine fear about expressing that because it might not be the correct choice. That's an interesting way of approaching a love triangle. And number four, it's a poly situation. Now that's what I opted for in Gods of Limbo, little spoiler, um, but it's either a polyamorous constellation, so there's a relationship with two people, or it's a throuple where all three of them are together. Either way, it can be solved that way as well. Because if there's genuine love with both partners, it is a culturally established narrative that neither of these can exist at the same time. Another thing to move past in our stories is if a character acts possessive and jealous towards your protagonist, like in Fifty Shades of Grey, why is your character, why is your protagonist flattered by that? And ask yourself that. Why do they think that is genuine affection? Where is that belief coming from? Where is that root coming from? Because that is an innate devalue of oneself and that's a beautiful thing to explore. But I see it so often in stories that it stops there, that someone is possessive and jealous and then your protagonist thinks, oh, that's romantic. And it stops there. We don't question that. We accept that it's romantic, but it's not. So what happened to your character that they see these actions as acts of love instead of violations of their own autonomy? And if your protagonist is the jealous kind, why do they attach their worth to the actions of another character? What need is met in them? What what needs are they seeking to meet and why? Who taught them that love can only exist in a monopoly? Why are they so dependent on this idea? And why are they discarding the other aspects of that potential relationship that they're looking at or striving for? So please help jealous characters. I love reading about jealous characters that are well examined because it's a very interesting human emotion and facet of our human nature. So beautiful. You can make your protagonist jealous, but look at it with a critical lens. And if you want to write a story about relatable jealousy, take both your character and the reader on a journey with it. Don't make the beginning point of relatable jealousy also the end point. Question what's relatable here so that your reader can have a process of their own. So you can absolutely portray the cultural norm. Just don't stop there. What's behind it? Fear, insecurity, unmet needs. What's 
can we examine about the relationship? And I want to say again, this is not about abandoning monogamy at all. This is about looking at the depth and complicated facets of relationships outside of cultural norms. So please don't think I'm saying here that unless your characters are all in polyamorous relationships or all open, their love isn't real. That's not what this is about. It's about jealousy and possessiveness being a romanticized and necessary factor in that connection. It's about defining love not as an enforced obligation, but as a freeing fulfillment. So let's ditch the trope of romanticized jealousy and instead explore the depth and growth that it's covers up. Storytelling shapes societies, shapes our culture, and if we offer our characters more perspectives and more options and directions in which they can grow, we offer our readers and each other more perspectives and more options in which we can grow. That's why I think it is super important to examine tropes that we have all accepted but might be unhealthy for us. I'm really excited to read all your genuine, beautiful, romantic plots, platonic plots, sexual plots, all the relationships, give them to me, I'm excited for it, you got it. That's it for today, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please leave a like or a dislike and a comment. Please share it with anyone who you think would benefit from it as well. Uh, I'd love for toxic traits to be talked about and discussed more openly. So let's continue the, um, the discussion in the comments. Tell me about stories that do this really well. I always love hearing about new shows, movies and books that examine culturally, no culturally accepted norms. So I really want to hear about your opinions. If you have any questions, also leave them with me. Uh, discussions. Let's keep talking. You can find us on social media at Story Manifestors and our website is storymanifestors.com. We offer writing service, acting service and empowerment coaching. Uh, you can email us. It's also in the description if you want to know more about that. Uh, we have a newsletter on our website as well where we send out news. <laughs> um, my personal Instagram account is this one at leah.falls and uh, at Forgotten Splinters is my book series account. The, my debut novel is coming out next summer, uh, June 2021. 2021? Yes. Uh, it's an epic fantasy novel called Goddess of Limbo. Right now I'm posting a lot of fantasy content, general trivia. So if you're a fantasy fan, there's mythology, there's memes. It's a lot of fun. Go check it out. Um, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Much love and I believe in you. Have a great week.